So last class we were looking at uh, the shielding gases, right? So the uh, the various characteristics of uh, the gases and how uh, these shielding gases are affecting um, the R characteristics. And uh, we also looked at uh, the primary functions of the shielding gas is to strike an arc, to strike an uh, low voltage arc, which uh, is needed for our uh, applications, right? So what is the primary function? is to have an, a sustained low voltage arc throughout the welding process. So, and apart from that it also protects the well pool from the atmosphere, right. So, so first is the low voltage and then protection from the from the atmosphere, okay. And apart from that, there are a lot of secondary functions we looked at. So, for example, uh, the well bead geometry, the depth of penetration, as well as the the width, the the weld as aspect ratio can be seriously affected by the uh, uh, the sealing gas. Okay, and we looked at uh, the the relationship between right. So, for example, uh, the arc pressure, arc arc temperature. So, if it is an in, in arc radius, so if you use uh, uh, an argon, so your, uh, the, the arc pressure will be extremely high in the center of the arc, okay. Whereas, if you use uh, uh, either diatomic gas or gases with uh, you know, high thermal conductivity, is not it? So, high thermal conductivity is defined by how good in the convection heat transfer in some of the gases. And then what happens? The uh, the temperature can be effectively transferred by the convection uh, to the outside, the envelope of the arc, isn't it? Suppose if you, this is pure argon, if you replace this with an uh, argon plus say uh, some amount of helium, so then the temperature would uh, the arc pressure and the temperature uh, would would be something like homogenizing something like this, isn't it? So because of the effective heat transfer from the, the arc core to the arc envelope and this would lead to uh, obviously the, the penetration characteristics, right. So the selection of shielding gas uh, you know it is also determined from the physics of arc, like how good the gas is in, a, a, in terms of uh, a transferring heat from the arc core to arc envelope um, as well as you know, if you use a diatomic gas the similar thing happens, there the heat conduction will be very effective because of the de-dissociation, right. So then the, the same effect you would also expect when you use a, a diatomic gas with the mixture of argon. So the selection of shielding gases you know you need to be really uh, careful uh, uh, and if you want to control the heat input or you want, you want to change the bead geometry, so you can accordingly uh, uh, change the composition of the gas from one gas to other gas. Suppose if you also see that um, you, you need to increase the productivity. Okay, so then you can also choose the gas which gives high heat input. Okay, so high heat input can be obtained by increasing the arc energy. Uh, the arc energy can be increased again if you use a gas with high ionization energy. Okay, then the the amount of heat liberated per ionization process Ca is also high. The electrons which are emitted from the ionization process, if you have a high ionization energy gas, the energy the the, the energy of electron which is emitted is also carry you know high energy because the ionization energy you give in, it is actually released by the electrons, the energy the electrons carry that. So obviously when those high energy electrons collide, there will be high energy exchange and leading to high heat generation. So arc energy increases, right. So suppose if you want to increase heat input, obviously you can also use an, an high ionization energy gas as well. And some of the gases we looked at can also be reactive, for example carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide would also dissociate and then it will form carbon monoxide uh, and oxygen. Subsequently you may also end up stripping carbon monoxide into uh, carbon and oxygen but that is very unlikely. But you may also expect some carbon pickup in the, in the, the base material, okay. So that then you will also change the base material composition, is not it? And same goes with the oxygen. So if you use oxygen in a shielding gas, the oxygen can also be uh, get dissolved in the base material and the, the your base material uh, uh, the oxygen concentrations can increase, right. And uh, 
that may lead to an uh, uh, non-metallic inclusion formation or if you have uh, highly reactive uh, elements added to the base material for example aluminum. So aluminum readily reacts with oxygen and then it will eat away all the aluminum in the liquid metal into aluminum oxide slag okay so that can also happen. So the secondary function of the, uh, the sealing gas is very critical as well to determine uh, your, your choice for the sealing gas. Okay. So similarly, uh, you may also have a material with varying uh, thermal conductivity. Okay. So for example, comparing the austenitic stainless steel to conventional low carbon steel, the austenitic stainless steel have a 3 times lower thermal conductivity than the conventional steel. So now imagine you use the argon uh, for uh, uh, low carbon steel and you want to suddenly weld, you, you assume that this is the same thickness and it is also steel, right? stainless steel. Okay. So you can also use, why do not you use argon, simply argon as you use in a conventional uh, uh, steel, low carbon steel. But you may end up getting uh, extremely deep penetration in stainless steel okay, because stainless steel they are very poor conductor of heat, they are very low thermal conductivity compared to steels. So suppose if you uh, want to achieve uh, uh, an, a wider penetration or wider bead geometry something like that. So for example, so this is your base material, your bead on plate and you see that you know you are in, in a conventional uh, low carbon steel your bead geometry is something like that when using argon. But if you use the similar parameter, same welding parameter with the argon when you weld the stainless steel, okay, the heat is not transferred effectively. Okay. So you will contain the heat. So you will end up making in a very narrow bead and you will have a sagging of pool because weld pool which is there in the, uh, in the middle would start heating up because it is not transferring heat. So you will end up having an, an a well pool sagged. So in this case, what do you do immediately? You will have to distribute the heat in the arc, is not it? So instead of using argon, so you can add uh, some uh, high conductivity gases. You can either add uh, helium into argon or in stainless steel, austenitic stainless steel you can also uh, add hydrogen. Okay, so a 5 percent hydrogen uh, added to argon is commonly used for austenitic stainless steels because to effectively distribute the heat so that you, know, you can increase the well bed width. Yes, it is clear. So these are all the considerations, uh, the secondary considerations uh, are commonly used uh, while selecting the sealing gas. It is not like you know I have an argon bottle, can I uh, consume it? Okay. So it is not like that. I mean uh, the, the welding procedure selections, what do you call WPS. And it is a very large exercise if you want to generate an welding process parameters and we will have to consider all these aspects uh, in order to generate a sound well bead. Okay? Good. So sometimes you, know, you also see an effect of the dissolved gases on the surface tension of the well pool because surface tension of the well pool can also change your bead, bead characteristics. So again, so these are all secondary functions uh, you need to consider while selecting the sealing gas. So that is what we looked at in last class, right. So we will move on to the material specific sealing gases by considering all these aspects and then in this class we will see you know what are the commonly used sealing gases for a given, uh, uh, given alloys, okay. So we will start from uh, steels. The sealing gas is uh, uh, for a GTAW is argon, okay. And if you are using an, an, a metal metal arc welding or in a shielded metal arc welding, in most of the case sometimes you use in a self shielded electrodes. What do you mean by self shielded? That means the sealing gas is generated by burning the flux. So, so these fluxes generally contain CaCO3. So when you burn this, so it becomes CaO plus CO2. That is how you generate the shielding gas. Okay, so by burning, though so this gas is generally used for arcing. Okay, so carbon dioxide is also uh, widely used for uh, very low end applications. So again, if you use pure CO2 as a shielding gas, and uh, there are a lot of problems we looked at it, you know, because of uh, the dissociation um, and uh, uh, the very reactive nature of the gas, uh, the arc voltage increases significantly. So any diatomic gas would lead to increasing in uh, arc voltage. So why? Why do they increase the arc voltage? Because when you have, a, uh, you need to have a sustained generation of ions so that you know you will have a, a good electrical conductivity. So again, the relationship between the electrical conductivity 
with the number of uh, electrons. What is that? Can you recall? Come on, guys. Sigma is equal to e square e and then n e and then l e. Come on, I am older than you. 8 m e k t by 5. So, this guy, what is that n e? So, the number density of electrons, is not it? So, now if you have a uh, uh, gas with high ionization energy or diatomic gas. So, what will happen then? The amount of electrons in the arc it decreases significantly, is not it? Suppose if you have diatomic gas, so the de dissociation would eat away the already dissociated gas atoms or gas molecules. Okay, so, then the, uh, again the process has to be started again to generate more electrons, is not it? So, in that process, your resistivity of arc increases significantly because you lose the electrons, is not it? So, if resistivity increases, obviously voltage would, what is the relation between resistance and voltage? V equal to I r, good. So, what happens then if r increases? for a given current voltage increases obviously so so it's all again coming from the physics so when you use a diatomic gas your resistance of the arc increases then voltage increases for a given field right so that is the reason that when you are using an, an say for example co2 your heat input also increases significantly the arc energy increases significantly because voltage increases Okay, it's clear. So for manual metal arc welding, if you are doing a very rough work, see what is good, reasonably better, because you want to have a very high heat input so that you can weld more volumes. Okay, so you can melt and then deposit. You can weld more volumes. So carbon dioxide, pure carbon dioxide can be used, but and because of all these dissociation phenomena, the increasing voltage. If voltage increases, then the arc stability decreases because the fundamental definition of arc is you need to have a very low voltage and high current, is not it? So, so, then the arc stability decreases significantly when you use a carbon dioxide or any diatomic gas, it is clear. So, for steel, uh, no, no, to in order to uh, if you want to have a very good quality wells done, so, so safe bet is you use argon. But argon again, it will you will have a deeper penetration and if you want to weld and in an autogenous uh, mode. So, you will have to spread the heat. Okay? So, generally we add 1, one or 2 percent or 5 percent carbon dioxide or helium or in arsenic stainless steel hydrogen so that we can spread the heat. Okay? So, otherwise, you will have a very narrow bead and which is not good for the mechanical properties of the weld. Right? It is clear. So, in this, in this table I just showed you the commonly used uh, uh, the shielding gases. So, argon and helium when it can be used for um, any material to be safe, right. So, but then these are expensive gases, okay. So, you cannot use it for uh, in, a, in a roadside uh, in a shop if you want to repair your motorbike, okay. So, you would not expect uh, you know, that guy to use a uh, helium as a shielding gas, but then you will bankrupt, okay. So, so you bet, best bet is to have an um, SMAW either with the carbon dioxide cylinder, the black you know, cylinder which you uh, commonly have observe and then uh, just weld, melt you, so you just need a, a, a joint, is not it? So, in a, in a, in a conventional uh, uh, steels when you are welding it, we use it argon and argon plus some composition, some uh, elements we add, some uh, gases like in a carbon dioxide or sometimes oxygen. Oxygen is also commonly uh, used not more than 2 or 3 percent to have a non-metallic oxide inclusions to stabilize or to promote acicular ferrite formation, is not it? So, acicular ferrite is known to nucleate on non-metallic inclusions. So, toughness of the, uh, the weld increases significantly you know, by uh, adding oxygen, so that oxygen can form an inclusions which in turn can act as a nucleation sites for acicular ferrite, the microstructure, right, it is good. So, again the carbon dioxide is commonly used to carbon steel and uh, the problems I put already here. So, 
So oxygen, uh, uh, again, so oxygen can also affect uh, the oxidation of some elements which are dissolved, like for example, aluminium. And uh, in fact, uh, two weeks before, um, we, we were trying to add aluminium um, in uh, metal metal arc welding uh, fluxes. We, we were aiming for 1% aluminium in the base material, but we could never get uh, not even more than 0.5% aluminium because all aluminium is eaten away by oxygen as a slag, ultimately you have aluminium oxide slag. So it is very difficult to uh, have aluminium added from the consumable to the base material when you are using in a, in a consumable welding process because aluminium is very difficult to you know, um, add by from the electrode to the base material because aluminium would oxidize readily from aluminium oxide. Okay? So you need to have a proper control shielding uh, to have aluminium uh, diluted to the, the well metal. Okay? Sometimes we use nitrogen. So nitrogen is commonly used uh, for copper. Okay? So helium is uh, most advantageous for copper, but nitrogen is also equally uh, good convective gas, uh, but not as good as hydrogen or helium, but it is expensive. Okay, both hydrogen and helium. So some, sometimes nitrogen can be used, but nitrogen can never be used for nickel alloys. Okay, I will go one by one in the slides because of nitrogen induced porosities. Okay, so we will see one by one. So I am just giving summarizing in this uh, table. And hydrogen, not pure hydrogen, pure hydrogen never used in welding, then you will have a fund in the lab. Okay. Uh, so hydrogen in some moment is added uh, again to distribute the, uh, the heat arc. Uh, temperature because it is also very highly convective gas. Okay? Uh, and mainly for austenitic stainless steels uh, to overcome the problem of low conductivity, thermal conductivity, uh, to in order to increase the bead width, so we add hydrogen so that uh, you can also add helium, both can uh, work well. But the principle is the same, the convective gases distribute the heat in the arc so that the bead width can be increased and uh, if you use uh, diatomic hydrogen, obviously the arc voltage increases leading to heat input increase, increasing heat input and we can do it, now we can weld it faster because we have a wider bead and then high heat input, you can weld faster, so productivity increases, right, it is clear. So, so whatever you choose a shielding gas, it all comes from the physics, what is studied so far, the equations are derived for the thermal conductivity, it is also important. Right? So, that gives the basic knowledge about how the arc temperature is generated, the relationship between the ionization and the, the electron flow in the arc. So, that would in turn determine by the composition of the shielding gas. Okay? And the heat transfer I taught you, it is also again determined by the nature of the shielding gas. The conductive uh, uh, heat transfer determined by the collision as well as the dissociation and deionization. Is not it? And the convective uh, transfer, buoyancy and the plasma jet formation again related to the density buoyancy flow. Uh, less density gases are highly convective. Okay? So, it is all physics. So, we may see that welding is not a an, 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 an white collar job, you know, welding does not have any hard science, but it is wrong. So, so, we need to understand all the physical phen phenomena behind this process so that we can control the process much better. Okay, good. So, we will go one by one. The first thing is, uh, you know, I just put uh, very salient features of what we discussed so far. Uh, so, we can look at uh, readily re referred uh, these slides um, for welding of steels. For example, organ is very widely used. So, we can add with 5 percent hydrogen only to weld austenitic stainless steel. Okay, for ferritic or martensitic or, uh, or conventional low carbon steels, uh, you, you can never use hydrogen then you will end up having a, just a simple cracked wellments if you use hydrogen for BCC structure or even a BCT tetragonal structure or HCP structures. So, you can use hydrogen only for FCC. The reason is due to because of so hydrogen induced coal cracking, okay, hydrogen embrittlement. Okay. So, we add um, uh, some amount of helium again to increase the productivity, the reasons I already explained. So, the helium is a highly convective gas, 
so that you know we can spread the arc heat and you to make a wider bead and uh, because of high ionization energy so obviously <coughs> heat input also increases it's clear it's good so uh, for gtrw for steels uh, argon uh, is the commonly used um, shielding gas for gmaw sometimes we mix it with uh, helium okay for uh, low carbon steels to increase the heat input as well as to improve the bead geometry and uh, arsenic stainless steels uh, the hydrogen is commonly added up to 5% good next is aluminum again uh, so aluminum you, you can uh, use argon so so most of the cases you'd be welding with an uh, uh, thin sheets of aluminum are welded mostly by gtw gas tank snark welding right and uh, so not any other gas okay so mostly argon is uh, used uh, for uh, welding of uh, gas tungsten arc uh, welding of aluminum alloys okay and increase uh, again to if you want to use thicker section uh, obviously you can add helium so helium can be added up to 80% in fact uh, to increase the depth of penetration by increasing heat input right to reduce number of passes so obviously right so in the, in the steels of course apart from argon and helium carbon dioxide is also commonly used so i forgot to mention about it for low cost low cost uh, uh, low cost welding uh, again so carbon dioxide is very cheap and very economical to use for large applications for example you now construction applications uh, when you want to weld uh, kilometers um, so carbon dioxide uh, based process also very widely used uh, especially in uh, Uh, structural and uh, marine shipbuilding st- applications you know in a conventional ship you know, we we were working on a, on, a, on a project to develop a welding process procedure se- a selection wps uh, to fabricate the world's largest ship okay so uh, the the ship dimensions are so huge uh, the actual length of ship is uh, 750 meters almost uh, yeah 3/4 uh, of a kilometer and the width of the ship is 250 meters almost uh, so that is the, the actual dimension if you want one place to one tip to other tip one hull to other hull, back side you need to walk a kilometer okay so the length of the weld of the entire welds were done to make the hull it's close to 30000 kilometers of welds so the plates were the hull plates were made with uh, s690 high strength steels of thickness of 20 mm and each weld has six passes of 30000 kilometers of welds 30000 kilometers of welds imagine amount of gas we must have used okay it took us more than 7 years to build the ship so we were developing the welding procedures and if you use helium we would consume the entire helium in, uh, during this process okay so the best bet is to use carbon dioxide isn't it so otherwise uh, no if you use argon the entire project will be bankrupted right so you'll be using uh, tons and tons of uh, argon so these kind of voluminous applications co2 is the savior but then there are some problems as i explained the high uh, the arc voltage uh, heat input uh, reactive gas but then we'll have to play around with the parameters so that you now we can optimize uh, the process for uh, pure carbon dioxide okay so it's also commonly used it is not advisable but we can work with that right good so, so for aluminum as i said the argon is widely used uh, welding of aluminum is always tricky you know, in in terms of availability aluminum alloys are always problematic child's problem child you can say okay, because of cracking and various issues uh, because of uh, uh, the thermal conductivity uh, distortion issues uh, so the control by, by controlling the arc characteristics uh, is uh, the safe bet to at least to weld aluminum alloys so most of the cases when you are welding aluminum we use simple argon and we don't want to complicate the uh, already complicated uh, situation by using uh, additional mixtures okay so argon is widely used and helium mixtures up to 80% sometimes can be used to increase uh, the penetration to weld the thicker sections yes it's good so welding copper and copper alloys so obviously copper is highly conductive material isn't it so if you want to uh, contain the heat 
so you need to do it in high heat input isn't it so otherwise heat will be dissipated you will not be melting the material effectively because heat is dissipated much quickly so you will have to increase the heat input of the arc so that you can make uh, some penetration some melting isn't it so obviously if uh, uh, the, the arc heat input has to be increased the best bet is to use high ionization gas right so the helium or helium organ mixture helium 80 percent and 20 percent organ is highly used so that you know you will have a high heat input gas so if helium is really expensive and we can also use nitrogen so the nitrogen is also it is not that dangerous not that ineffective as a carbon dioxide so nitrogen once it is dissociated it becomes highly convective okay so in that case the ionization energy of pure the atomic nitrogen also higher okay than the carbon monoxide that means that you can generate high heat input arc and the, the heat also can be distributed somewhat effectively using nitrogen so for low cost low end uh, uh, welding of uh, copper alloys pure nitrogen is widely used okay so um, it can be diatomic nitrogen and then uh, we can uh, play around uh, with the welding parameters to achieve uh, uh, the uh, yeah reasonable uh, penetration but then nitrogen again because of uh, de dissociation dissociation the stability arc stability decreases same as carbon dioxide uh, the voltage increases by using uh, diatomic nitrogen so it may lead to a lot of problems but we will have to overcome that if you want to have a low cost gas yes it is clear so far steels aluminiums copper so this is not only the R characteristics we will also consider the base material characteristics when you are choosing a shielding gas yeah it is clear good so again welding of nickel nickel alloys so the commonly used uh, uh, mixture is argon and argon helium so we can never use nitrogen for nickel so, okay because of the the issue of nitrogen porosity okay so nickel alloys are known for this the defect the gas porosity by nitrogen and if you don't use proper shielding see you may also end up getting nitrogen porosity because nitrogen can get diffused into nickel from atmosphere okay so nitrogen porosity is a very common problem and the other co common problem is uh, nickel vaporization when you are welding nickel okay so nickel vaporization can also be uh, very severe because the difference between the melting point and the vaporization point of nickel is uh, yeah, quite low compared to other materials so nickel would uh, vaporize uh, uh, very instantly so then that will also affect the your shielding okay so because metal vapors are denser than so what the shielding gas uh, generally use so you'll end up uh, having nickel vapors exposed to atmosphere forming nickel oxides then that can be trapped right so best bet is to use argon because argon is uh, very dense in order to avoid this problem so you can so never use nitrogen because nitrogen would diffuse to <coughs> nickel leading to nitrogen porosity okay so you can add hydrogen hydrogen improves the uh, fluidity fluidity means uh, the, the ease of flow so that you, know, you can spread the uh, bead effectively if the fluidity increases right and then you can also reduce the porosity because hydrogen is uh, already reactive so the most commonly used uh, sealing gas for welding uh, nickel uh, nickel alloys argon or plus argon argon plus nitrogen hydrogen sorry yes is clear so these are all uh, material specific sealing gas selection so first we saw the sealing gas selection in a, in, a, in a gas composition perspective and then using that knowledge from the metallurgy of these base materials 
So we can choose uh, which gas is you know, very commonly uh, can be used for welding these alloys. Yes, it's clear.